The senator from Oregon. Mr. President, the United States Senate is preparing to pass another four-year extension of the USA Patriot Act. I've served on the Intelligence Committee for over a decade, and I want to deliver a warning this afternoon. When the American people find out how their government has secretly interpreted the Patriot Act, they are going to be stunned and they are going to be angry. And they're going to ask senators, did you know what this law actually permits? Why didn't you know before you voted on it? The fact is, anyone can read the plain text of the Patriot Act, and yet many members of Congress have no idea how the law is being secretly interpreted by the executive branch because that interpretation is classified. It's almost as if there were two Patriot Acts, and many, many members of Congress have not read the one that matters. Our constituents, of course, are totally in the dark. Members of the public have no access to the secret legal interpretations, so they have no idea what their government believes the law actually means. And I'm going to bring up several historical examples to try to demonstrate what this has meant over the years. And before I begin, I want to be clear that I'm not claiming that any of the specific activities I discussed today are happening now. I'm bringing them up because I believe they are a reminder of how the American people react when they learn about domestic surveillance activities that are not consistent with what they believe the law allows. When Americans learn about intelligence activities that are consistent with their understanding of the law, they look to the news media, they follow these activities with interest and often admiration. But when people learn about intelligence activities that are outside the lines of what is generally thought to be the law, the reaction can get negative and get negative in a hurry. So here's my first example. The CIA was established by the National Security Act of 1947, and the law stated that the agency was, quote, forbidden to have law enforcement powers or internal security functions. Members of the Congress and legal experts interpreted that language as a clear prohibition against any internal security function under any circumstances. A group of CIA officials had a different interpretation. They decided that the 1947 law contained legal gray areas that allowed the CIA to monitor American citizens for possible contact with foreign agents. They believed this meant that they could secretly tap Americans' phones, open their mail, and plant listening devices in their homes, among other things. The secret legal interpretation led the CIA to maintain intelligence files on more than 10,000 American citizens, including reporters, members of Congress, and a host of anti-war activists. This small group of CIA officials kept the program and their, quote, gray area justification of the program a secret from the American people and most of the government, because they argued revealing it would violate the agency's responsibility responsibility to protect intelligence sources and methods from unauthorized disclosure. Did the program stay a secret? Mr. President, it didn't. And on December 22, 1974, investigative reporter Seymour Hersh detailed the program on the front pages of the New York Times. The revelations and the huge public uproar that ensued led to the formation of the Church Committee. That committee spent nearly two years investigating questionable and illegal activity at the CIA. The Church Committee published 14 reports detailing various intelligence abuses, which in addition to illegal domestic surveillance included programs designed to assassinate foreign leaders. The investigation led to executive orders reigning in the authority of the CIA and the creation of the House and Senate Intelligence Committees. In 1947, President Harry Truman and his top military and legal advisors secretly approved a program named Project Shamrock. Project Shamrock authorized the Armed Forces Security Agency and its successor, the NSA, to monitor telegraphs coming in and out of the United States. 
At the outset of the program, companies were told that government agents would only read, quote, those telegrams related to foreign intelligence targets. But as the program grew, more telegrams were sent and received by Americans, and they were read. During the program's 30-year run, the NSA analysts sometimes reviewed as many as 150,000 telegrams a month. While the Ford administration said that it made all pertinent information about Project Shamrock available to the Senate Intelligence Committee and the Justice Department, it kept the program secret from the public. They argued that public disclosure was both unjustified and dangerous to national security. And it avoided Congress questions regarding the legality of the program by stating that the telegrams present somewhat different legal questions from those posed by domestic bugging and wiretapping. And that program didn't stay secret either. The newly formed Senate Intelligence Committee ultimately disclosed the Project Shamrock program on November 6, 1975, arguing that public disclosure was needed to build support, build support for a law governing NSA operations. That resulting public uproar led to a congressional investigation, the NSA's termination of Project Shamrock and the passage of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act of 1978, which attempted to subject domestic surveillance to a process of warrants and judicial review. Years later, during the Reagan administration, senior members of the National Security Council secretly sold arms to Iran and used the funds to arm and train Contra militants to topple the Nicaraguan government. Selling arms to Iran violated the official U.S. arms embargo against Iran, and directly funding the Contras was illegal under the Bolin Amendment. That was the one Congress passed to limit U.S. government assistance to the Contras. But the officials at the National Security Council were convinced they knew better. They were convinced that violating the embargo and illegally supporting the Contra rebels would help free American hostages and help fight communism in Nicaragua. Instead of engaging in a public debate and trying to convince the Congress and the public they were right, they secretly launched an arms program and hid it from the Congress and the American people. Now, how did that work out for them? Now, the New York Times published the story of these activities on November 25, 1986. The Joint Congressional Committee was launched to investigate the Iran-Contra affair, which televised hearings for over a month. The House Foreign Affairs Committee and the House and Senate Intelligence Committees held their own hearings. The first Presidential Commission investigating the National Security Council was launched Multiple reports were published documenting the administration's illegal activities, and the Nicaraguan government sued the United States. Dozens of court cases were filed, and National Security Council officials, including new national security advisors, faced multiple indictments. Now, finally, following the terrorist acts of September 11, 2001, a handful of government officials made the unilateral judgment that following U.S. surveillance law, as it was commonly understood, would slow down the government's ability to track suspected terrorists. Instead of working with the Congress, instead of coming to the Congress and asking to revise or update the law, these officials secretly reinterpreted the law to justify a warrantless wiretapping program that they hid from virtually every member of the Congress and the American people. It's not clear how long they thought they could hide a large, controversial national security program of this nature, but they kept it so secret that even when it yielded useful intelligence, classification restrictions sometimes prevented the information from being shared with officials who could have used it. I was a member of the Senate Intelligence Committee at this point, a relatively new member, but the program and the legal interpretations that supported it were kept secret from me and virtually all of my colleagues. Again, did that program stay secret? The answer is no, Mr. President. After several years, 
The New York Times published a story uncovering the program. The resulting public uproar led to a divisive congressional debate and a significant number of lawsuits. In my view, the disclosure also led to an erosion of public trust that made many private companies more reluctant to cooperate with government inquiries. As most of my colleagues will remember, Congress and the executive branch spent years trying to sort out the details of that particular program and the secret legal interpretation, the secret legal interpretation that was used to justify it. In the process of doing so, Congress also attempted to address some actual surveillance policy issues. And I think almost all of my colleagues who are here for that debate would agree that those issues could have been resolved far more easily, far less contentiously, if the Bush administration had simply come to the Congress in the first place and tried to work out a bipartisan solution to them, rather than, in effect, trying to rewrite the law in secret. When laws are secretly reinterpreted this way, the results frequently fail to stand up to public scrutiny. And it's not surprising, if you think about it, the American lawmaking process is often cumbersome here, it's often frustrating, and it's certainly contentious. But over the long run, this process is a pretty good way to ensure that our laws have the support of the American people, since those that don't will actually get revised or repealed by elected lawmakers who follow the will of our constituents. On the other hand, when laws are secretly reinterpreted behind closed doors by a small number of government officials, and there's no public scrutiny, no public debate, you're certainly more likely to end up with interpretations of the law that go well beyond the boundaries of what the American people are willing to accept. Now, let me make clear that I think it's entirely legitimate for government agencies to keep some information secret. In a democratic society, of course, citizens rightly expect that government will not arbitrarily keep information from them. And throughout our nation's history, Americans have vigilantly guaranteed their right to know. But Americans do acknowledge certain limited exceptions to the principle of openness. We know, for example, that tax officials have information about uh, all of us from our tax returns, but the government doesn't have the right or the need to share this information openly. This is essentially an exception to protect personal privacy. Another limited exception exists for the protection of national security. The U.S. government has an inherent responsibility to protect our people from threats. And to do this effectively, it almost uh, always requires some measure of secrecy. I don't expect General Petraeus to publicly discuss the details of every troop movement in Afghanistan any more than early Americans expected George Washington to publish his strategy for the Battle of Yorktown. By the same token, American citizens recognize that their government may sometimes rely on secret intelligence collection methods in order to ensure national security in order to ensure the safety of the American people, and they recognize that these methods can often be more effective when specifics are kept secret. But while Americans recognize that government agencies sometimes rely on secret sources and methods to collect intelligence information, Americans also expect that these agencies will cooperate at all times within the boundaries of publicly understood law. Now, I have served on the Senate Intelligence Committee for a decade, and I don't take a backseat to anybody when it comes to protecting what are essential sources and methods that are needed to keep the American people safe when intelligence is being gathered. But I don't believe the law should ever be kept secret. Voters have a right and a need to know what the law says and what their government thinks the text of the law means. And that's essential so the American people can decide whether the law is appropriately written and they're in a position to ratify or reject the decisions their elected officials make on their behalf. When it comes to most government functions, the public can directly observe the government's actions and the typical citizen can decide for themselves whether they support or agree with the things that their government is doing. Certainly in my part of the world, American citizens can visit the national forests and decide whether they think the forests are appropriately managed. 
When they drive on the interstate, they can decide for themselves whether those highways have been properly laid out and adequately maintained. If they see someone punished, they can decide for themselves whether the sentence was appropriate, whether it was too harsh or too lenient. But Americans generally can't decide for themselves whether intelligence agencies are operating within the law or not. That's why the U.S. intelligence community evolved over the past several decades. The Congress set up a number of watchdog and oversight mechanisms to ensure that the intelligence agencies followed the law rather than violate it. That's why the Senate and House each have a select intelligence committee. It's also why the Congress created the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. And it's why Congress created a number of statutory inspectors general to act as independent watchdogs inside the intelligence agencies themselves. All of these oversight entities were created at least in part to ensure that intelligence agencies carry out all of their activities within the boundaries of publicly understood law. But the law itself must always be public. Government officials must not be allowed to fall into the trap of secretly reinterpreting the law in a way that creates a gap between what the public believes the law says and what the government secretly claims it says. Anytime that happens, it seems to me there's going to be a violation of the public trust. Furthermore, allowing a gap of this nature to develop is simply short-sighted. Both history and logic should make it clear. And that's why I brought these examples to the floor of the Senate today, that secret interpretations of the law will not stay secret forever, and in fact, often come to light pretty quickly. When the public eventually finds out that government agencies have been rewriting surveillance law in secret, the result, as I've demonstrated, is invariably a backlash and an erosion of public confidence in these government agencies. Mr. President, I believe that this is a big and growing problem. Now, our intelligence and national security agencies are staffed by many talented and dedicated men and women. The work they do is very important, and for the most part, they are extraordinarily professional. But when members of the public lose confidence in these agencies, it just doesn't undercut morale. It makes it harder for these agencies to do their jobs. If you ask the head of any intelligence agency, particularly an agency that is involved in domestic surveillance in any kind of way, he or she will tell you that public trust is the coin of the realm. It is a vital commodity, and voluntary cooperation from law-abiding Americans is just critical to the effectiveness of our intelligence agencies. If members of the public lose confidence in these government agencies because they think government officials are rewriting surveillance law in secret, it is going to make those agencies less effective. And as a member of the Intelligence Committee, I don't want to see that happen. I want to wrap up now with just one last uh, uh, comment, and that is that as you look at these you know, statutes, and particularly the ones that I've outlined where you have so many hardworking uh, lawyers and officials at these government agencies, I want to make it clear that I don't believe that these officials have a malicious intent. They are working hard to protect intelligence sources of meth and methods, and for good reasons. But sometimes they can lose sight of the differences between the sources and methods which must be kept secret and the law itself which should not. Sometimes they even go so far as to argue that keeping their interpretation of the law secret is actually necessary because it prevents our nation's adversaries from figuring out what our intelligence agencies are allowed to do. Now, I can see how it might be tempting to latch on to this Alice in Wonderland logic. But if the U.S. government were to actually adopt it, then all of our surveillance laws would be kept secret because that would obviously be even more useful. When Congress passed the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act in 1978, 
It would have been useful to keep that law secret from the KGB so that Soviet agents wouldn't know whether the FBI was allowed to track them. But American laws shouldn't be public only when government officials think it's convenient. They ought to be public and public all the time. And the American people ought to be able to find out what their government thinks those laws mean. Now, earlier this week, Mr. President, I filed an amendment along with my colleague from the Intelligence Committee, Senator Mark Udall, and that amendment would require the Attorney General to publicly disclose the United States government official interpretation of the USA Patriot Act. The amendment specifically states the Attorney General should not prescribe any particular it should not uh, describe any particular intelligence collection programs or activities, but that there should be a full description of the legal interpretation and analysis necessary to understand the government's official interpretation of the law. Now, this morning, Senator Udall and I and had the help of Senator, several colleagues, uh, Senator Merkley, Senator Tom Udall, we reached an agreement with the chair of the Intelligence Committee, Senator Feinstein. She's going to be holding hearings on this issue next month. Senator Udall and I, as members of the committee, will be in a position to uh, go uh, into those uh, hearings and the subsequent uh, deliberations, be in a position to try to amend the intelligence authorization. And if we don't get results inside the committee because of the agreement today with uh, the distinguished chair of the Intelligence Committee, Senator Feinstein, the majority leader, Senator Reid, we will be in a position to come back to this floor and offer our original amendment this fall. Now, we're going to keep fighting for openness and honesty. As of today, the government's official interpretation of the law is still secret. Still secret, Mr. President. And I believe that there is a growing gap as of this afternoon between what the public believes that law says and the secret interpretation of the Justice Department. So I plan to vote no this afternoon on this legislation because I said some time ago that a long-term reauthorization of this legislation did require significant reforms. And I believe that when more members of Congress and the American people come to understand how the Patriot Act has actually been interpreted in secret, I think the number of Americans who support significant reform and the end of secret law, the end of law that is kept secret from them by design, I think we will see Americans joining us in this uh, cause to ensure that in the days ahead, as we protect our country from the dangerous threats that we face, we are also doing a better job of being sensitive to individual liberty. Those philosophies, those critical principles are what this country is all about, and we are going to stay at it, Senator Udall and I and, uh, and others, until those changes are secured. Mr. President, with that, I yield the floor.